I hope to keep this uh, uh, interactive and ask me questions because I don't want to be talking you know, and everybody falling asleep. So I will be asking you questions on the way. There may be a quiz at the end. Um, I'm not sure I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, a few more people. So OK, today I'm going to talk about prediction of the epigenome uh, from DNA sequence. Let me start with the introduction briefly. Uh, my name is Hei Gyeong Im, but people call me Haki because in Argentina where I grew up, uh, nobody could pronounce my name, so it was simplified to Haki. And here I tell people pronounce it like the sport, Haki. Anyways, so at the moment I am at the University of Chicago in the section of genetic medicine. So I run a genomic data science lab, and our mission is to develop statistical and computational methods to make sense of large amounts of genomic and other high dimensional data with the ultimate goal of making discoveries that can improve human health. Okay. So uh, why predict the epigenome from DNA sequences? Or, uh, well, I am interested in doing that because I want to know, learn about disease biology and how we do it. We use GWASs like many of you here. So as you all know, uh, over the last two decades, we have been, we as the field, have been running uh, many, many GWASs and are discovering more and more loci that are uh, robustly associated with uh, a myriad of complex traits. But uh, the, you know, the mechanism is still not known. Uh, most of these variants are non-coding, so we don't really know for the majority of them which are, what are the causal genes. So let me start like uh, as a background to so build some context. So the components of a GWAS, what is a GWAS? In a GWAS you have phenotype, this vector Y with N individuals. You have your G uh, genotype matrix uh, where rows are people, columns are SNPs. Let me just focus on SNPs for uh, simplicity. And then a GWAS is nothing more than just a series of linear or logistic regression where you uh, regress your Y on each one of these columns, one column at a time. That leads you to this SNP level results table where rows are SNPs and it gives you uh, effect size. I like to call it delta because delta disease. Anyways, uh, standard error and p-value, small p-values are good. Those are your discoveries. Okay. But as I told you, we discover all these loci, but we don't know what they mean. We don't know their, what are the causal genes. So why not run a gene level association where you take the transcriptome where the columns now are genes instead of SNPs and fit your Y, your phenotype on uh, the transcriptome on gene expression levels. So where do we get the gene expression levels? Well, you could measure those, right? And then you would have running these regressions, you would have these gene level results that are probably much more interpretable than SNP level results. <coughs> so, but there are some problems with that. Uh, RNA sequencing is too expensive to run at this uh, scale. So we run GWASs with millions of individuals. Doing that uh, for RNA sequencing would be at the moment uh, not feasible. Uh, and also there are many tissues such as brain, pancreas that we cannot really access, right? So the other problem uh, with this approach is this reverse causality. So disease will cause changes in the transcriptome and then when you find the associations, we cannot tell whether it's the disease that's causing changes in the transcriptome or the other way around and we are interested in finding the causal effects. So that's why uh, some, you know, I think it's almost 10 years ago, I proposed to use the genotype to predict the expression levels of genes. So once you have that um, algorithm, you can take the genotype data, any GWAS will have that, predict the expression levels using these models, and then run an association between, predict, uh, the, between your phenotype Y and your predicted transcriptome. Okay, so can we do that? And yes, we have been doing this for the last many years. And so, for example, we use the GTEx data, that's our reference transcriptome data set where we have genotype data, and then we have transcriptome data, gene expression levels for 50 different tissues. So we fit this linear model where T is the expression level, so this column here, one column at a time. There are more sophisticated ways in which you could do joint analysis, but that's what we did. So you take one uh, column and fit against this genotype matrix. 
So you estimate what we are calling the genetically regulated expression levels. So once you have these weights, you save them in a database we're calling PredictDB, and then you can go to your GWAS and predict expression levels. So how well do we predict expression levels? And here are four genes that are cherry-picked for being rather well predicted. So ERAB2, NATC2, PEX6, and ERAB1. You can see that on the x-axis is the predicted expression level, and on the y-axis is the observed expression levels. And you can see that our squares are pretty high. So that's all good. But what happens more generally, so if you look at all the genes, so these are about 13,000 uh, protein coding genes, we can estimate the heritability of their gene expression levels, and then we order them by that estimated heritability. That's why it kind of goes up the black uh, dots that are behind this cloud of red dots, right? So the red dots are our estimated uh, prediction performance. So you can see that on the right, the highly heritable genes, meaning genes that have expression levels that are highly heritable, they tend to be predicted well, and genes that have expression levels that are not heritable, they are not predicted well as expected, right? You cannot use genotype to predict something that is not heritable. Okay. So there are many advantages to gene level associations. I will skip this slide uh, for the sake of time because I want to go to the part that I'm more excited about. Uh, there are also proofs that these uh, methods are useful to identify drug repositioning candidates, also uh, uh, um, genes that are targets of drugs that are, um, have been successful historically from the databases, they tend to be more significantly associated according to this uh, approach, the PredictScan association, or more generally known as TWAS associations. Okay, that's all good, but of course there are limitations of this, what I call population-based predictors. So we're not very good at predicting uh, low heritability genes. Uh, those are probably more relevant for disease. Uh, the performance drops when you go to non-European populations because most of the training data we have are from our European populations. And also effects of rare variation is completely missed because we just don't have the power to uh, detect those effects. So any questions so far? And stop me. And as I said, I'm, I'll be asking you questions, so do ask. <laughs> if you any doubt, ask questions now. Yeah. being less relevant? More, re more relevant. Oh, more. more relevant. More likely, yeah. More likely. more likely, yeah. Did I put it right? No, you, that was a, why do you think these ones are, are low? Heritability. Because those that cause the disease will have, you know, the selection will tend to, uh, like, weed them out, right? So that's why genes that are important, they are not very variable. We don't find many QTLs of uh, Mendelian genes, for example. Explained by common variant, yes, yeah. Because we want to apply to GWAS is where we are sort of looking at common variation. Yes. Uh -huh. Just a quick one for calculation. Mm -hmm. When you use this prediction, it's all in SIS, right? The it's all in SIS, yes. Thank you for uh, the question. Yes, because trans, it just brings too much noise. We don't have enough power to detect trans association, trans QTLs. Okay, so now the question is, could deep learning methods help? So I asked this question myself, uh, like more than a year ago now, more than that. Anyways, so while well, there's this method called Informer that some of you may have heard of, uh, it's, I would consider, the state-of-the-art method that takes DNA sequences, so it takes about 200,000 base pairs of DNA sequence, runs it through these like, layers of the neural network, and out comes uh, epigenetic tracks. So as examples, here is DNA is uh, C14 positive monocyte uh, female. So what happened? Okay, yeah. So this is this uh, DNA is uh, sick experiment. So the track uh, for chromosome 11 between 35 million some uh, around that region, this covers about 120,000 base pairs. 
So mm -hmm. these uh, in green are the measured epigenetic tracks from ENCODE epigenome, uh, roadmap epigenome and other sources of uh, similar sources. So you can see several uh, chromatin accessibility tracks, uh, histone modifications and cage disease gene expression levels. So you can see green is the measured observed uh, tracks and blue is the predictive one by informer. So it looks very impressive, right, at least to me. So this is just another view, so you, like the way it works, you just plug in your DNA sequence, about 200,000, through this, let's say, black box informer, and out comes this matrix that is 5,313 epigenetic tracks and 896 bins. Each bin corresponds to 128 base pairs. So this is your epigenetic um, features predicted by informer for this input region. So I like kind of look at the, uh, the, this, um, the actual tracks, right? So there are 5,000 of those. So there are many of them are DNAs, and you can see there's a DNAs-seq experiment for testes, muscle in the leg of a female embryo at 105 days, male embryo, frontal Gyrus, gyrus, male adult at 78 years. So there's huge amount of data. This, you get it for free. You just plug in your DNA sequence and you can predict all of this um, from that run. So to give you a sense, I could run this on my MacBook uh, M1 that has the newer um, chips, or well, not the M2, the M1. And it takes one run, it takes about 15 seconds. If you run it on a supercomputer like with NVIDIA A100, uh, that takes about one second. So just to give you a sense of, uh, yeah, scale. Is it the one row, is it for one sequence? So one run, yeah, I knew it. So why is this not working the way I, I want to go back to my slides? Yeah, so one run is gives you this matrix that has 5,313 epigenetic tracks and 120 KBs. So if you want to cover the whole genome, you would have to run this tiled like 20, 30,000 times. So it takes one second to run one, but if you want to run the whole genome for one person or for the reference genome, it takes 30,000 seconds. So things get kind of you know, out of control very quickly. Yeah. Any sequence, you can just make up a random sequence and it'll, the software will take it and it'll give you some output, right? Maybe just garbage, but yes. Yeah, so it doesn't know whether this is human, this is mice, anything. You can pull, plug in any random sequence of uh, AGCTs and it'll give you the corresponding epigenetic feature for these 5,000 different right? So they, there's open chroma, chromatin accessibility experiments, histone modifications, 2,000, over 2,000 transcription factor binding, uh, uh, transcription factor, chip -seq experiments, and cage experiments. These are the 638 gene expression levels on different cell types, as I was showing you previously. So how do we uh, actually calculate or predict expression levels given this? So we can take a person's uh, DNA sequence, plug it into Informer that gives us this matrix of 5,313 by 896. And uh, so among the cage experiments, there's one column, the 51100, that is the lymphoblastoid cell line. So they use this one cell line to train these uh, prediction models. So they train everything jointly but you can extract this one cell line. So you go to your transcription start site, uh, look at the three bins around the transcription start site, average the output from there, and that's your prediction. So you can do this for multiple people, and then we want to, you know, we want to compare to the observed values. So uh, let me make a stop to kind of you know, point you to a subtle difference uh, between the correlation. So if you have your predicted expression levels, right? Let's say you have many people here and many genes on the rows. So you have act, you also have, let's say, in some cases, we also have the observed expression for the same people and for uh, the same genes. So we can compare 
um, this green column. So for one person, so this is person one, we can compare the expression levels of all the gene for that person uh, predicted versus observed, right? So this is this plot here uh, <coughs> where we will want to maximize right, the correlation between uh, prediction and observation. On the other hand, we may, want, may be interested in this other direction where we have people. So for a given gene, our uh, people, this, uh, the predicted expression across people uh, correlated. So there's the cross genome or cross gene correlation and cross people correlation, which are different things, right? So in former, when it was trained, and all these uh, DNA sequence models, they used the reference genome. So there is no genetic variation, and they tried to maximize this correlation between across the genome. And then what, um, OK, so my question is, well, if you are interested in running GWAS, TWAS, or things of that sort, what would you be more interested in? In this correlation across people or correlation across genes? This is my first question to you. <laughs> across genes? Across people? Yes, yeah. So that's, yeah, true. Good job. Um, so this is the one that's relevant for uh, GWAS or TWAS. I want to see whether gene A is more highly expressed among disease patients compared to controls, right? That's what I'm interested in. So the thing is, since Enformer was trained to maximize this cross genome correlation and not cross individual correlation, and it was never exposed to genetic variation, there's really no reason to expect that it will work well, right? Okay. So then uh, my students uh, tested this. We used this method that I showed you before. He, they took the DNA sequences from Jovadis individuals for whom we have, we can generate this prediction, but, and we also have observed lymphoblastoid cell line expression levels publicly available. So uh, for this gene, PEC6, which was one of the highly well uh, predicted genes by PredictScan, you can see that uh, x-axis is observed and y-axis is predicted. So it's pretty good, right? So dots are people. So this is the type of correlation I am interested in. So it looks like there's not many genotype cues for prediction because you can see. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. So that's something we have a paper where we uh, published that uh, gene expression I levels. <laughs> Gene expression levels are yeah, it's sparse. It's not polygenic, right? There's or at least not kind of obviously polygenic. Gene expression is very polygenic. It's just that all the rest is in, in trans. <laughs> yes. So the part that we can detect is mostly the large effects are sparse. There may be a background of trans polygenic effects, which you know we don't really have sample size to address that, but maybe these methods will help us with that, right? So we'll see. We, we're not there yet, but yeah. So this is just one example. Again, cherry-picked. How about this one? This is uh, not D2. Yes, that's how I see it, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's negative, right? But the thing is, again, it's a matter of expectation. We there's no reason, like these uh, models were not trained to uh, predict variation across individuals, There's right? No that variability was. In, in any of the predictions they, they've the never data. seen, they don't know what variability is because all they've seen is uh, the reference genome. So they use the reference genome and encode measurements which come from not the reference genome. So there's a lot of mismatch between what the true kind of the, the, the gen the gen gen genome was that generated the epigenetic features and the genome that we are using, which is the sort of this reference genome. So I look at this and I see the glass half full, but that's not how people interpret it. So there were these two papers uh, kind of came back to back. I think they're being uh, reviewed at the same time. 
um, that are saying, you know, personalize uh, these DNA sequence methods are great, look great, but they actually don't do, don't work well. And th the thing is, this kind of um, this assessment caught on. So a lot, I see papers saying, you know, this method that they are doing. Oh, we are so good at predicting gene expression levels, and we don't use transformers because it's been shown that they are not that great, right? And they cite this preprint, which is a bit of a, you know, anyways. So, for example. So the two papers pretty much say the same thing. So that if you look at the personalized thing, and it's kind of reflecting what we are seeing here. You get very good correlation, positive correlation, significant correlation, but in opposite direction. So um, the second paper, uh, preprint, uh, they show the correlation across genes, right? Here is they are talking about the same thing. This is a correlation across the genome. That's pretty high in the order of 60%. But if you look at the correlation across individuals, they say, and they compare to our method, PredictScan. So PredictScan does best. That's great. <laughs> great press for us. But you know, I don't agree with that because they are reporting means of things that are <laughs> clearly positive and negative, right? So I don't think it's fair to say that it works. It's poor predictor and show you the mean prediction when in the same preprint, they are showing this, um, uh, this positive and negative correlation. So another way, I, I used to do finance. So you know, if you have a strategy that consistently loses money, you can make money because you short that strategy. You sell that instead of buying it, and you make money. right? So we can take advantage of this. It's, you cannot say it's very poor, more work needs to be done. Yes, I agree, more need, work needs to be done, and we are working on that as well. But we can also take advantage of what everything that this thing has learned to advance what we have been doing. Right? We've been training predictors of gene expression levels, and we need hundreds of samples to do that. This prediction was done with one sample. right? So this kind of opens the way to generate genetic predictors using samples as small as one. That's, um, you know, I'm starting to be a bit provocative, but you know, it, it, so you get some useful things. So uh, I don't know how I'm doing with time. So uh, let me show you one example where we are applying this on transcription factor binding. So this is the team. Uh, the guy doing all the work is here, Temi. He's the graduate student, uh, rising third year graduate student, and then a large team of support uh, members. So the idea how we're going to do this, so I, as I told you, Informer predicts the epigenome from the DNA sequence. So now we need a method to take the, DNA, uh, the epigenome to transcription factor binding. Um, Right, that's what, I, what we're looking for. And it so happened that one of our collaborators, Tiffany Amaruta, uh, had developed this method called IMPACT that takes um, epigenetic features and predicts exactly transcription factor binding. So we are using her ideas um, to uh, implement our method that we're calling TFPRED. So we're predicting the transcription factor. And it, essentially, it's a hybrid between, yeah, it's a kind of a combination of informer plus impact. So impact takes um, motif sites, predicted motif sites, and then checks whether there is a chip uh, experiment peak. So if there is a peak, it's a 1. If there's no peak, it's a 0. So it goes across the genome. So we have many measurements where we have ones and zeros, and then all these epigenetic features. So chromatin accessibility, histone modifications, and 5,345 features that um, uh, Tiffany used to predict uh, this impact score, which is, in essence, uh, probability or something related to transcription factor binding. So here I just put my y is, you know, these are zeros, these are ones, and zeros, and so on. So this is the y, the here are the x's, and we run a logistic regression and uh, find the weights, these weights that will allow us to uh, predict the transcription factor. So yeah, the idea is very simple. We so in order for the training, we take the reference genome and predict the epigenome. So once we have the predicted epigenome, we uh, fit this model, y, of ones and zeros, and try to find these weights that will take this epigenome and turn it into either ones or zeros. 
So, okay, that's what we do. Once we have this, we have Informer, which is already out there. You can download the weights, they are publicly available. Um, and then we generated this weight so that we're ready to do a prediction. So again, you take the DNA sequence of each person, generate, now we generate the personalized epigenome, and then we run it through impact, so just multiplying by the weights, corresponding weights, the epigenetic features, that gives us a prediction, and then we want to compare to observe. So we did that with androgen receptor binding. So we did androgen receptor binding because as far as we know, this is the only transcription factor in prostate, in tumor, uh, that is uh, in the market. So nobody else has generated transcription factor binding prediction from, DNA, from genotype, right? That's because if you want to do this with the traditional population-based model, you have to have at least 100 samples. 100 chipsick experiment can be, I don't know, from what I've heard, 300,000, half a million dollars. So it's an expensive uh, experiment, right? So, but this, uh, our collaborators have done it, they have generated uh, this, so we were able to test whether our scores are correlated or are predictive of whether the transcription factor, in this case androgen receptor, was bound or unbound. So this is again a cherry-picked um, uh, example. So in this site we can see we have these predictions, so unbound on the left, bound on the right. So if we go through the about 13,000 sites where that were variable, um, we can see that uh, this results. So this is the, uh, the t-test, or you can run either a logistic regression with this as outcome, or you can run a t-test between these two groups, right? So it should be more or less equivalent. And uh, this is the distribution of p-values uh, across the 13, 20,000 or so uh, sites that we tested. So, if you remember, uh, under the null, if there was no relationship between our prediction and the observation, we should see a flat distribution of p-values, and you can see there's a small, you know, uh, accumulation of uh, small p-values. So I kind of just uh, eyeballing the, the histogram, I estimate that we have about 200 sites that are significantly predicted with our method with a false discovery rate less than 5%. But, you know, this may be too, um, so too um, uh, conservative or too pessimistic a view of how this works. So what we decided to do is to take the CWAS weights, right? These people have already uh, generated predictors for, um, CWAS is the, the method that the, the, the authors of this paper um, um, kind of developed. Uh, it essentially, it's like a TWAS, but instead of uh, predicting expression levels, you predict transcription factor binding. So they generated this weight, so they shared those weights with us, so we could take the genotype data and using our uh, regular pipeline that we have for PredictScan, we predict uh, CWAS scores. So these are the predicted uh, androgen receptor binding according to this model, the CWAS model. And then we can compare that to our method where that takes informer impact and it generates the same thing. So rows here are people and columns here are different loci. So for each locus we have, and for each person, we have a score that tells us higher scores should be related to binding and lower scores should be non-binding. So this is a way for us to compare our predictor with the genetic component of transcription factor binding uh, as generated by uh, the, the CWAS scores. Okay, so how does that work? Like, pretty good, right? So this is, um, again, cherry-picked. I think this was our best uh, uh, locus. So you can see on the x-axis is our method prediction, and then on the y-axis is the CWAS scores. So to remind you, CWAS scores was trained using 120 uh, people, chipsick experiments, very expensive. What we did is we took uh, like three or, I don't know, but 10, um, prostate chipsick experiments for androgen receptor from uh, the Systrom DB database, uh, not necessarily completely match with what they had done with the observed data we're looking at, but kind of close enough, and uh, we generated our prediction. So this cost half a million dollar 
give or take. Ours cost is not free. It may be, I don't know, a few thousand dollars in compute. Um, OK, so that's our best uh, site. But how about the rest? So again, this is the p-value of the correlation between our prediction and the CWAS prediction. And you can see, again, the p-values under the null should be flat. We see a much bigger accumulation of uh, small p-values uh, here near the origin. And you can, again, ballpark, we can estimate about 2,500 um, sites for mm. which there is a significant correlation between CWAS scores and transcription factor binding scores at FDR less than 5%. Here is the correlation, so this is the bad part. So under the null, we would see uh, most of the correlations in between these two uh, peaks, but we find many that are much bigger than um, expected by chance, all the way to almost um, 90, more than 90%. But again, the same thing we saw with the expression levels, we see a lot of negative correlation. So we are working on trying to improve this. Uh, it may be that Informer, DeepMind publishes Informer 2 and they solve this problem for us, in which case we don't need to worry about it. So we are not completely uh, in, like spending a lot of effort on this, but we are looking into ways to solve these negative correlation issues. So now that we have the pipeline, what we would like to do is uh, to build transcription factor scans. So we, I want to develop, so we have, so far we have androgen receptor in prostate uh, tumor sample. So we would like to do this for the 3,000 or so transcription factor tissue pairs that are available in Systrom. And then for a given disease, we want to look at different disease locus and maybe disease locus two, uh, identify the transcription factors and the cell types that are relevant uh, for that uh, locus. So that's the goal. And OK, so in, let me summarize. Uh, Informer predicts many aspects of epigenetic regulation with impressive performance, in my opinion. Uh, the ability to predict well across individuals, I would call it its zero shot learning in the sense that it was not trained to do that, and yet it's able to do that. So I think we should give them some credit for that instead of criticizing them that it doesn't do well enough. Um, despite the sign flips, that we are finding, uh, we, I think we can use Informer to train predictors, uh, modulo the sign, we don't get the sign right. Uh, the point is we have, we can generate this pipeline that can generate genetic predictors using just a handful of samples instead of hundreds or thousands of samples that we, are, uh, we need when we use um, uh, population-based uh, approaches. So I've shown you an example where transcription factor uh, can be uh, binding for androgen receptor can be um, predicted using just a few samples, and it's competitive with population-based methods that are much more expensive to generate. We're applying the single-cell data. It's just the right uh, context to use this. So we um, they have many, many contexts, few samples. So we are so we have a project, ongoing project. Uh, doing that, uh, that's going to be called single cell predict scan, uh, to be kind of obvious. Um, longer term, we want to improve Informer. We want to build uh, DNA language models and fine tune it to our specific goals. So if you're interested in joining the team, let me know. We can collaborate. We can, yeah. Anyways, yeah, thank you.